Good evening, everyone. We will momentarily start our womanist Zoom dialogue. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's Zoom, womanist Zoom dialogue entitled Unmasking Whiteness, a Multiracial Conversation. I am Reverend Dr. Mitzi Smith, the host of Women in Zoom Dialogues, and the J. Davison Phillips Professor of New Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. In her book, in her 2018 book, White Fragility, Dr. Robin D'Angelo states that white fragility refers to how quickly white people tend to have meltdowns or become defensive when confronted with their racism. D'Angelo argues that white people need to humble themselves to receive feedback from black and brown people about the perpetration of individual acts of racism and systemic racism. Black and brown people are the experts. We have lived it all our lives. To, agree. to be sure, our experiences as black and brown people, however, they do differ. There are black and brown people who would rather act as if racism does not exist, could be a coping mechanism, who believe that niceness and an abstract kumbaya love is the cure for all racism and races. Race and, and racism, although social constructs, have a deleterious, to say the least, impact, tangible, debilitating, trauma-inducing, and deadly impact on black and brown peoples, individually and in terms of communities. Ibram Kendi in his book, Stamped from the Beginning, demonstrates that white people first practiced racial bias prior to instituting policies and laws to support those practices, and finally constructed ideologies to normalize those biased practices and laws. Racist policies and ideas are based on self-interest. The consumption of racist ideas produce hatred against black peoples and brown peoples. And Kendi further argues that historically, historically both anti-racist and racist forces have continually progressed in this country. There has never been anti-racist progress without simultaneous advancement by racist forces in this country. It has not been the case that we take a few steps forward and one step back. But both sides, history proves, move in tandem. White people cannot eliminate racism by proclaiming themselves woke or simply by reading anti-racist literature. Mm -hmm. Racist policies, laws, systems, uh, and behaviors must be exposed, named, abrogated, reformed, and transformed. Silence and the denial of racism and how it has shaped white people or institutions and how it impacts brown and black people will not result in dismantling systemic racism or in personal transformation from the ways we all have been shaped, devalued, dehumanized, subjugated, and oppressed. So our panelists tonight and let me say how this Zoom dialogue uh, came about. Uh, Dr. Angela Sims approached me uh, saying that her colleagues, her friends and colleagues had been having conversations. And so she asked if we would host it on the Zoom dialogues. And of course, 
uh, I thought it was a great idea. And so here we are. Uh, our panelists tonight, um, alphabetically, and they will determine what order they go in. Uh, Dr. Sharon Jacob is the Assistant Professor of New Testament at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California. She is author of Reading Mary Alongside Indian Surrogate Mothers, Violent Love, Oppressive Liberation, and Infancy, Infancy Narratives. Dr. Angela Parker, if you've been watching, you've seen her often in these uh, uh, dialogues. Is, a, is assistant professor of New Testament and Greek at Mercer University's McAfee School of Theology here in Decatur, where I am. Dr. Carrie Whipple is Dr. Parker's psychic. <laughs> they, are, they, they are each other's psychics. <laughs> She is, um, she earned a New Testament, a PhD in New Testament from Drew University and is faculty fellow in global works and society at the New York University of Liberal Studies. So this is how tonight will go. Uh, Dr. Parker, Dr. Whipple and Dr. Jacob will have an intimate conversation about the kind of work that they are engaged in around whiteness and solidarity in the context of the Amy Coopers and the Karens of the world. So they are allowing us to listen in. After their 30 minute conversation, dialogue, we will um, have responses uh, from Dr. Marcia Riggs, who is the Erskine Love Professor of Christian Ethics at Columbia and the Almsbuds person at Columbia Theological Seminary, and Dr. Tina Pippen, the Wallace M. Alston Professor of Bible and Religion at Agnes Scott College. And you probably saw her a couple of days ago as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will hand uh, the, um, this sacred space over to these three uh, ladies uh, as we disappear into the... <laughs> space with the rest of you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Smith. We greatly appreciate you just allowing us this time to have this conversation. And it's interesting because, you know, we are all three assistant professors or what uh, those of us in the academy would call junior scholars. And so in the beginning of witnessing the horrific death of George Floyd and then also seeing Ahmaud Arbery being gunned down and thinking about Breonna Taylor and the just the way that black bodies are 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 just don't matter. I remember I was sitting on my couch in Atlanta and I was looking at the protests on or yes, the protests on various streets across the United States and I got a a Facebook message from Sharon. And so Sharon and I started commiserating and talking. And then of course that meant Carrie got into the conversation as well. And so we were all kind of just commiserating and just figuring out what, first of all, we're junior scholars. We're all scholars of the New Testament. And we recognize that we have to have some kind of voice in the midst of what it means to have these conversations on race, on anti-blackness, on the um, abuse against black and brown bodies in these United States of America, but also what it means to have these conversations in our varying institutions as well. And what it means for us to have these conversations as junior colleagues, it, colleagues in our academic guild. And I remember the conversation beginning with, I'm just angry. I'm angry about Ahmaud Arbery. I'm angry that it took a video to, to finally get someone arrested. And I'm angry that it just seems as though continuously over and over again, our bodies just don't matter. And I have to just, just say and admit that in the midst of this conversation, I just still hold on to anger. I never get to a kumbaya moment and I never get to a let's think about reconciliation moment. But the one thing that I can always count on in the midst of me being angry is that my friends don't get upset when I get angry. So I have to bring in my colleague, Carrie Whipple, Whipple and Dr. Smith said that we're partners in crime, which we are because Carrie's always been a, a conversation partner that 
and a friend who can be in the midst of my anger and not fall into white women's tears. And so our time at Union, when we were both PhD students at Union Theological Seminary, where I could actually see what a white woman in allyship and solidarity looked like with me, and we may talk about that a little bit later on, that's where those, that trust began to occur. And then when I was um, first year teaching at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology, I was able to be on a Wabash cohort. And it was interesting when we get to Wabash that my brown sister, Sharon Jacob and I began to commiserate over similar issues and instances that we both were facing in our institutions as black and brown women, but also similar situations that we would experience with senior male colleagues in the academic guild. And so by virtue of all of us being able to have those conversations about what it looks like for a black woman to be angry and lord knows a black woman is not supposed to be angry in the academy you got to temper yourself but then also to be able to express that anger to a white woman who's not going to fall into tears which is always important and then to be able to have the same conversation with my brown sister who we can commiserate on what it means to be close to whiteness and close to whiteness in the academic field but also in society as well so that's how these conversations came about. And I just wanted to contextualize ourselves a little bit. Great, thank you, Angela. And I, I wanna say thank you to Dr. Smith and everyone who's being here for part of this conversation because we really do want it to be a dialogue. And as Angela laid out, the foundation of this dialogue for us is built in trust, built in holding a multiplicity of emotion, of reaction, of having space to work through that, to question, and also to have space to pull back and to look at ourselves in the midst of this while we're in dialogue with one another. And so as we're looking at this theme of unmasking whiteness, I just wanna lift up a couple of the themes that the three of us have talked about some, um, and that really came out of my own experience um, as a white queer woman who grew up in Michigan where um, race is both covertly and overtly discussed. That, you know, we, there are ideas of what Detroit is. Um, legislative ignorance around the Flint water crisis. But yet we have um, white folk who can show up deck to the nine and AK 47s into the Capitol, and there's not going to be any violence against them taking over these spaces. Um, so and yelling <laughs> and yelling in the face of um, law enforcement, uh, because again, they feel their rights are being taken away because of COVID. Um, and so with that, it made me reflect on how we also see these mirrored within the academy in certain ways. Um, and for myself as a queer white feminist, what does this mean? And so two things I just wanna lift up as we begin the conversation. Um, first, within feminism, particularly white feminism, and it links to what Angela was talking about, about white women's tears and the ways that they are weaponized. Um, when Sharon approached us, it was in the middle of the Amy Cooper incident in Central Park, just a few blocks from where I live. Um, and, and seeing the way that she weaponized these tears, both in a place of creating a vulnerability, but then also um, an escalation into anger and rage, which Dr. Jacob will talk about a bit as well. But this idea that white women have an ingrained victimhood, yeah. an idea that um, both culturally and with our kind of Euro-American ideas of violence and trauma, that there is a victim and is a there is a perpetrator. These two people stay separate or groups of people and white women almost always will want to cling on to this idea of being the victim. The victim. Um, they do not want to look at the ways that they victimize, um, the ways that they perpetrate violence against uh, their black and brown sisters. Uh, and thinking about this in the academy, um, this looks like silence. Silence when we see the overt racism. Um, yes. Something that I'm also, um, aware of in myself of when do I stay silent as I'm looking at my position as a junior scholar. Um, but also the idea of um, then the more overt issues of actually 
putting down, stepping upon and over um, black and brown colleagues um, and, and using this institutionally as well, not just faculty, this is staff, um, this right. is the entire community. And as Angela alluded to, that's part of what brought us together on um, the issues of white women in power using yeah. black and brown women's bodies and their wisdom and their souls for their own purposes and not being checked in that process, but instead employing tears to try to get around their own power. Yeah. Um, can I contextualize yeah. this a second? For Because for those who are listening and when we talk about our time at Union, we're usually referring to the 2012 Women's Legends Ball, just in case y'all wanted to contextualize where we're talking about. Definitely. <laughs> Yes, and, and, um, and we can go into that more, but the other piece yeah. I just want to say too is it can be subtle as well, um, and it can be among white feminists. Um, for example, I was told very early on in my doctoral process to not consider myself a white feminist, to call myself a feminist, right. that by trying to acknowledge my white privilege and power as part of my scholarship, it was threatening the power hold on feminism that white women have. So the need to look at that issue. Yeah. A second piece I just want to put in too um, is the, and this comes more out of um, my work with as a queer scholar and a queer woman, um, the idea of respectability, an infatuation yeah. with respectability that has come out in the midst of the protests and riots, um, and and seeing this particularly within queer communities, um, uh, just being supportive of protesting peacefully against police brutality, but when we move into riots and violence and looting, a silence, an uncertainty, a, a fear of what's going on, um, neglecting our own past of how liberation has come through riots, um, often led and organized by our black and brown kin. Um, so as we're seeing in the midst of this too, um, the brutal murders of um, our trans kin, particularly trans kin of women of color, um, yeah. so Dominique Fells, Rhea Milton, and not having that voice. Um, we're willing to be radical in the academy, in our scholarship, we'll play with queer theory, um, but when we're actually working with real bodies, what does that mean? And so also when we're having discussions like this, um, often I have seen in the midst of the past couple months, um, if there is a white person on a panel talking about this, they are often part of the LGBTQIA plus community um, because somehow they seem to be safer or more akin to the conversation. There's an inherent idea that they are anti-racist. And this is something that is not a full truth and something that also the queer community has to work into um, as part of this conversation because whiteness and respectability um, invades as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you both, Angela and Carrie. That was a beautiful way to set off this conversation. I also want to take this time to thank uh, Dr. Mitzi Smith, uh, Dr. Tina Pippin, and Dr. Marsha Riggs for giving us this space and providing us the space to have this conversation. Um, I want to begin our conversation today by talking about the breast tax. Uh, the breast tax was imposed on lower caste Hindu women in the kingdom of Travancore, which is now present day Kerala, until mm -hmm. about 1924. Uh, it basically meant that lower caste women who lived in India had to pay a tax the minute they hit puberty, depending on the size of their breasts. Mm -hmm. uh, lower caste women who refused to, uh, who re uh, were also refused the choice to cover their breasts in public, especially in front of upper caste people. There is a famous story about a woman named uh, Nangali who lived in the 19th century who cut off her breast in protest of this caste-based tax. Mm. But what does this have to do with our conversation on whiteness today in 2020 in the midst of a pandemic? Just like whiteness, the caste system in India is steeped in privilege, supremacist thinking, and what I want to term and explore and break open today as white incredulity or the sheer astonishment that whiteness feels when folks of color or lower caste people demand basic human dignity. Mm -hmm. Coming to the video of Amy Cooper that began this conversation between Dr. Sparker, Whipple and I, something kept irking me when I saw the video and the interaction that folded between Amy Cooper and Christian Cooper in Central Park. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it was actually the depiction of white incredulity 
that is transformed into white rage, which is then directed towards the black, towards black and brown bodies. Yeah. The term incredulity is the feeling of not being able to believe something or not wanting to believe. In the Amy Cooper video, you see white incredulity come through on the screen when Christian Cooper tries to tell the white lady to put her dog on a leash. In most of the stories about Karens, it is usually the white lady who takes it upon herself to police black and brown bodies in public. In this case, the tables are turned. It is a black man asking the white lady to follow the rules of the park, albeit the rules created by the white men, but I'm di digressing. <laughs> the belief on this, the disbelief on this woman's face and voice is worth noting. It gives a glimpse of her white incredulity. And when the realization begins to sink into her that a black man actually is asking her to follow the rules, she immediately flies into a rage and weaponizes her white female body to be used against this black man. Yeah. As scholars of color in the academia, and particularly junior scholars, we encounter white incredulity quite often. The idea that it is impossible for people of color to produce scholarship that is intellectual, original, and brilliant mm -hmm. is white incredulity. Scholars of color are often told that we, have no, we will have no trouble finding jobs because our skin color is desirable to institutions. When professors of color receive glowing student evaluations, it is often deemed or chalked up to the only reason why the students like your course is because you give out easy A's. <laughs> the white disbelief that you may actually be good at your job is never a consideration. Right. Professor, professors of color are, are often um, qualified to stand in front of the classroom and teach but our words are often looked at with suspicion and disbelief. The white incredulity of how could this person actually teach me anything yep. is something that we face throughout in our career. To Can be I clear, white <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, but it's just because the other pieces, we all do Bible and everybody yes. knows Bible as well. So. Yeah. Yes, 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 because <laughs> yeah. everybody's an expert on Bible, yes. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, Keep going, Sharon, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, so I mean, what I was going to say is the whiteness is so ingrained in us that it is not just white students, and I really want to call our students yeah. of color here to task, who react yeah. to professors of color by looking, looking at them, to use Du Bois's words, through the eyes of the other. Mm -hmm. uh, Black and brown bodies being told to tone ourselves down. And this is what Angela was talking yeah. about because yeah. our bodies just get in the way. Yep. My counterparts are allowed to enter into rooms with their whiteness and white privilege intact. But my brownness is asked to be left out of the room. And if mm -hmm. she does enter, I need to keep her in check. Yeah. And the white incredulity when my brownness shows up or God forbid speaks up. You are not invited, I am told subtly. I'm just too scary and threatening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a South Asian woman, my brownness is meant to be fetishized, eroticized, and sexualized. And if by chance I deviate from the script, then I am met with an onslaught of white rage. Right. White rage is directed towards black and brown bodies in both covert and overt ways. It is the white anger at black and brown folks who are not grateful enough that we have been invited and given a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Junior scholars and particularly scholars of color are often told that we need to be grateful because in this terrible job market, we have been given employment, yeah. that institutions have chosen us over hundreds of application and here we are complaining about the ways we have been treated unfairly. Yeah. The other side to this white uh, is white incredulity. If you are a scholar of color who managed to end land, getting, land up getting a job before your white counterparts, the sheer astonishment of how did you, how did of you all the people, end up with a job? It's hard to be a white man in the academy. Yes, <laughs> I have actually been told that. Um, Mentoring is, an, <laughs> yes, mentoring is is an important part of academia and our professional relationships. But what happens when people of color politely refuse to be mentored? The white rage comes into full force. Yeah. 
Mentoring also needs to be, uh, also needs consent and trust. Yeah. There's an automatic assumption that black and brown bodies need to be mentored, which often means to be taught how to do things the right way. Right. It is also, mentoring also becomes a way of infantilizing black and brown bodies. Mm -hmm. White rage comes into full force when people of color and black folks politely refuse to be mentored by a white person. The incredulity of rejecting me and yeah. my mentoring is quickly transformed into anger and often leads to the exit of people of color from institutions. This is a story that many of us are very familiar with in the academia. People with roots in the international community also experience white rage that is deeply troubling. Let us not forget that even as we are speaking, we're in the midst of a pandemic, the midst of yeah. protests, migrant children are continuing to be held in cages at the border. The bodies of immigrants whose status is connected to their employment are particularly vulnerable, since many times we cannot speak back. So we can be yelled at and screamed at, and also then be told by our white counterparts that we are working on our racism because look at me, I'm staying in the room and I'm willing to learn. Right. But when the person of color, when the black person turns around and says, I refuse to be in the room with you and experience your white rage, I am immediately met with the ridiculousness, the white incredulity, because I am not doing my job by exposing my body to the onslaught of abuse, all in the good name for my white counterpart to learn to be rest, less racist. Right. There is an inextricability between white incredulity and white rage that is so intertwined that unraveling them appears impossible, but not that it can't be done. Yeah, yeah. So how, because we're, I think we're talking about a lot of different things here. We're talking about white incredulity. We're talking about white fragility and as white rage as, and rage so as women in the academy oftentimes we we want to do our scholarship we want to do our work but we get that onslaught of well you're supposed to do the work the way i'm telling you to do the work or you're supposed to do the scholarship mm -hmm. the way i'm telling you to do the scholarship and it often comes about i i kind of think from white male perspective, which then seeps into white feminists and white feminists replicate themselves. So how do we begin to get out of this or even how, first of all, just survive it. But see, the thing is, I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive. That's the conversation that we were having is how do we make sure that we stay interconnected so that we do have enough longevity within the academic guild in order to thrive and survive and then thrive. So I think that was part of the questions that we were beginning to have as well. Right, right. And yeah, because, you know, um, I think back to, you know, I'm, su I'm sure those of us who, are, who know international uh, scholars or who are international scholars have often heard that, you know, when we walk into a room and we're talking English, there is this idea that you know we can't we can't understand you because of the accent, and right. that 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 phrase itself is so deeply problematic because the issue is not with my accent; the issue is with your hearing. The yeah. more you spend time with somebody, you begin to understand them. Mm -hmm. So you know you maybe you need to change your hearing rather than me learning to tone my accent down and start to sound more white. You right. know, so this is all part of how do we survive in the academia. Um, well, that's inter interesting because we also, I, I, I read my evaluations and part of my evaluations are I'm too loud or yeah, I'm yeah. too boisterous or yeah. I, I laugh too, just a little bit too much or something. So it's always this idea of you're not supposed to be your full self, even yes. the, just entering into a room and beginning to teach or you know. And how many of us have had white male professors who have been loud and boisterous yeah. and but that's okay, you know, they're considered intellectual, right? Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Because that's Sorry, part, No, that's part of the white culture that seeps into all of our institutions. Yes. Right. That if you are not white, you need to become white enough to be a part of the culture. We've hired so we have a good pamphlet. 
or diverse, right? Um, yeah, so we yeah. can show that our faculty is someone we're proud of or progressive liberal institutions. Yeah, but yeah. if we haven't actually changed the culture, then it doesn't matter. Then people leave because you have such a toxic environment that not only are you having students having issues, you're also having to take care of students mm -hmm. who are dealing with white culture. And then you have the white women coming in your offices to cry on your lap and yes. ask you to take care of them because their white fragility is there, which as then Sharon showed, if you don't provide the right response, flips to white rage and they'll find ways to not support you. Yeah. And so or, that's the funny thing. The funny thing though is the white folks who come into your office after they've witnessed you being degraded yeah. and they're yeah. crying about you being degraded yeah. and you're sitting there thinking, wait, wasn't I the one who just yeah. Yeah. Uh, hold on, why am I the one who's not allowed to cry? So that's yeah. another piece to that as well. Yeah. yeah. And I'm I'm also I'm I'm also, you know, uh thinking about because I ha I get the same um the, the same kind of feedback, right? I, I'm also too loud uh because there's a there's a perception that you know when they hire a Indian woman, I'm brown you know, which means I'm safer than a black woman because I'm right. not black enough. And Angela, mm -hmm. you and me have talked about how yeah. there is a, some kind of safeness that is seen in my skin color, except mm -hmm. when I then, you know, go into a room and then I, you know, show up with my scholarship and my education and my voice, then all of a sudden I, it becomes, oh my God, you are, you know, you're scaring me right now. Mm -hmm. And so there, you know, this, this binarization of our bodies, right? We're either right. too loud or too soft or, you know, um, too, uh, too passive or too aggressive is, is, mm -hmm. is a way that doesn't allow us to be our full selves. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That's so true. All right. What else did we talk about ladies? <laughs> Just that proximity. Yes, and then I also um, one of the things I do want I do wanted to say was also um, and when we talked about how we build solidarity and and bridges and one of one of the things that we talked about was you know being the mirror and the reflective piece for one another yeah. because what I see happen often is that because we have been so much part of the system of whiteness that you know those of us who are folks of color and black folks just yeah. start to work in the system of whiteness and start behaving uh, yeah. within yeah. institutions like, you know, white men in power. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I remember that one time someone told us or told me, I remember specifically when we were at Wabash, that for me to say or to require that students address me as Dr. Parker was acting like a white man. So here's then the question. Why is it that when my body comes into the room, you can automatically begin to think that you can call me Angela, but the other person who yeah. comes into the room, you're going to defer to them as Dr. So-and-so or so-and-so. And then when I require that you address me as Dr. Parker, you get mad at me because now I'm acting like a white man. Here's the, uh -huh. where's the delineation between, you know, not just trying to be close to whiteness, because I think for some people, they think that that's me trying to be white. Well, mm -hmm. oh, that's me trying to recognize that I've earned this degree as well. So mm -hmm. if I'm walking into the room and I'm your professor, then that's how you should address me. But I think the problem becomes where the, the people that we walk into the room in front of, they don't want to make that differentiation. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, but I... It, it's again that proximity to power you need yeah. to act white but without the power yes and yeah. and i think it kind of connects to what sharon was saying too about taking up space you're not allowed that much space mm -hmm. i'm allowed so much space white men are afforded so much space and so when we start to do that things distort and i think for white women there's also that idea though, that somehow we will have access to that power. Um, mm -hmm. We have to step on you to get it. And I think um, as mm -hmm. Sharon pointed out, kind of with our mirror idea, um, yes. you know, we have to look at it because sometimes too, who is holding up a mirror for us? Because sometimes it gets pretty distorted. They're kind of fun house mirrors that mm -hmm. allow certain things 
to just be erased um, certain aspects of power. So you can always be a victim. So you can, you know, only be seen as the loud black woman, the ways that these mirrors get created. So, and then how do we distort our own mirrors to either try to fit within these institutions or to say, I'm going to just smash this and get out of it. Right, right. right. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. So we do, we have to, and I think that's why I like this conversation so much because we do trust one another enough to hold up the mirrors to one another to say, wait, am I, am I acting out of my ingrained whiteness? Do I need to disinfect some of that whiteness out of me? Or am I not crazy in the midst of what's happening to me? So those yeah. things are important. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, one of the things that, you know, um, we talk, I talk, I told, I told you guys, I, I've always told you, you know, Carrie and Angela are my translators in the American uh, way, because what happened with me was, you know, I came to this country as an adult and I did not have a lot of the history on racism and whiteness. And very often when I would have an encounter with someone who used their white privilege on me. And when I went to people, um, you know, and especially if I went to white folks, uh, it was distorted. You know, I was being told, you know, it's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. They were not racist, you know. They right. just said, they just wanted to touch your head. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, they just <laughs> think you're, you know, you're, you're very pretty. Um, you just said so. Yes. I know. So, but but it, it is very interesting because, you know, so there is this there is this this feeling of what you're feeling and what you're seeing and what you're experiencing is not true and you know to to put it into the current context it, the, that's the context we're in right now uh, yeah. with the current government what you're seeing what you're experiencing you know is is not true I yeah. have the truth so yeah. it's it's very it's you know so you're walking around very unsure all the time. And it's so important then when you come across someone who actually, you know, you can trust, who actually turns around and says, no, what happened to you was deeply problematic, yeah. deep, deeply yeah. offensive, and you have a choice. Because very often for those of us who are from immigrant, fa uh, immigrant backgrounds, we feel like there is no choice. Right. And to have someone who says, no, you have a choice. There yeah. is a choice. There is a way you can fight and, you know, get out of the system. You don't need to stay in the system and be treated this badly. Um, that is very important. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing I think about allyship and uh, solidarity is doing anti-racist pedagogy in our classroom. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, for me particularly, um, helping my international students mm -hmm. see the ways in which whiteness is capitalized, commodified, and exported into their own countries. Because a lot of international uh, students come in or people who are immigrants come in thinking, you know, race in, in the United States is a black and white issue. Right. And right. what happened with us was, you know, when the silos are open and people begin to see how this whiteness is so insidious and affects all of us, mm -hmm. um, that's when we're not just building bonds locally, we're building bonds globally. Globally. And that's yeah. the first step to unmasking whiteness is recognizing yeah. that you wear a mask, whether you live in Atlanta mm -hmm. or you live in Ahmedabad in India. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's 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 important. You know. Yeah, I, it was interesting because one thing that you said, Sharon, was whiteness is sold as a commodity across the globe. And I was like, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Because yeah. it, it becomes not just Western ideals or Western mm -hmm. civilization, but it really does become whiteness being sold across the globe. Yeah. And yes. That then yeah. makes it difficult for us when we see the same thing happening on all of our bodies to yeah. say, wait, no, I'm in solidarity with you. I'm not right. in competition with you. I'm recognizing the same thing that whiteness does to your body, it does to my body as well. So then yeah. become conversation partners, solidarity fighters, allies in order to fight against the ingrained whiteness that gets into all of us. Right. And the supremacist thinking, right? Because I, I right. talk about Priyanka Chopra. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. Smith. Last, last point. I talk <laughs> about Priyanka Chopra who uh, uses whiteness, mm -hmm. um, you know, but will not talk about the deeply troubling policies in her own context. Right. Right. So. Right. Yeah. 
Sorry, well, this, this has been, I can't wait to see the rest of it. This, <laughs> this has been very powerful, very, very wonderful conversation, amazing, pro provocative. Uh, so we're going to bring in our two respondents, Dr. Riggs and uh, Dr. Pippin, uh, to respond to the conversation in the way that, that they want to. Uh, and then we will, once they respond, we will have uh, in, in interim dialogue with you all, we will have a Q&A, some questions from the audience and, and myself. Uh, I guess Tina said I would go first. So, okay, I'll go first. Um, all of you, uh, as Missy just said, made some very provocative statements and entering into, uh, it's certainly not a response that I'm going to give. It's more a dialogue with you some more because I was particularly appreciative of the move to talk about white incredulity because I'm so sick of white fragility. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I think your term, Sharon, is much more accurate and certainly cuts deeper <laughs> because it pushes on this whole notion that, you know, folks are walking around, yeah, just not believing we are who we are as we embody ourselves. Um, and in the academy, it just gets worse and worse. Uh, <laughs> And as someone who's in the field of ethics, yeah, I was also thinking, here I am with all these Bible people again. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the field of ethics, you know, I run into first that I'm working with a paradigm that is considered philosophical first. And the philosophical paradigm is one about <laughs> universalism and the importance of objectivity. <laughs> and the importance of individualism. And so as soon as I start talking about ethics as as, as much about uh, the social construction of those ideas <laughs> and not the reality of objectivity, that it's just not real, y'all. <laughs> and the minute I say that, the students are like, oh yeah, uh, it is, it really is. You know, let us show you how. <laughs> Um, well, you know, we're all wedded to this enlightenment paradigm that, you know, we can be rational, we can be objective, and we can find that which is universal. And it translates into our religious belief system when we want to say we're all created in the image of God, and that makes us all equal. But when I start talking about that image of God being something that is multivariable, <laughs> you know, and differently embodied and incarnated, uh, that's not what they had in mind. There's one image of God. First, there's one God that they've got an image of. And then, of course, I should, to use your terms, mirror that image of God. And when I don't, mm. oh, deeply problematic. So you all have, you know, uh, in talking about um, also the white rage that flows from our unwillingness to accept whatever the scripts are the definitions of who we are uh, and to debunk them or to ignore them. I mean, I'm a lot uh, older, shall we say, <laughs> than you all in terms of uh, my time within the academy. Yes, I have finally risen to the level of senior scholar. Uh, <laughs> at least I'm clear I've risen to that level. There's still some who aren't so clear about that. Mm. Uh, and so the interesting piece is that even once you cross that, what you think is finally that final hump, you know, there's still the questioning you know, about what you're doing, why you're doing, and is it really academic enough, you know? Mm -hmm. um, when I interviewed for the job at the seminary where I've now spent almost 30 years, and that was not my plan, uh, it just sort of happened to fit into a larger vocational uh, call. 
uh, but when I first got there and, you know, I decided to do a lecture on womanist ethics. And the first question out of my white colleagues' mouths was, well, do you know? Never. Do you know? You know, they studied any of these white guys. And I'm like, uh, I have a PhD from Vanderbilt University. <laughs> Trust me, they didn't let me out without knowing these people. <laughs> so um, at every turn, we still find ourselves having to say, um, hey, here I am, I'm defining who I am and what I do in this academy. Um, and so my posture going in, even as a junior scholar was, I had to decide what were the values that were core for me in terms of how I operated in that space. And, and I said to myself from day one, they had never had a scholar, who, a black scholar who was on a tenure track. And they certainly didn't have a black woman who had spent time in this role with them. And so I had to say to myself, it's not about whether you get tenure, but it is about the integrity of the way you progress through this place. And, and when you believe that your core values, the ones you're using to guide your, yourself through this, when those core values uh, become totally, uh, you feel that they're being attacked in such a way that the only way you can stay here is to give them up, then you will walk out. And that had to be my whole posture the whole time. And so there were moments when I thought, okay, now they've done it. They've gotten to the core and they're really screwing up. <laughs> and at that point, and this may sound rather, um, religious for some, but at that point I had to pray my way through it and say, okay, are my values still intact? Do I stay here? Is the call to stay here or is the call to go elsewhere? And I'd always get an invitation at that point to apply for another position somewhere. It would make me so angry. <laughs> and I would go out and do this interview and have a really great interview. But what it did was make clear to me that the grass is not greener on the other side. It was just gonna be another white academy. <laughs> so where was I going to do this work of being a womanist, liberationist, Christian ethicist? So Columbia got stuck with me <laughs> because God kept showing me, hey, stay here, keep at it, do it, call them on what they are and who they are and the way they're doing it. So, I mean, this whole question of survival and thriving, well, you really have to decide, I think, for yourself, what is necessary for survival? And it sounds like you all already at least have two other people on each side to query about that with. Uh, in some ways, I don't think I had as many partners in that conversation. Um, what is necessary for survival? Uh, and then if those conditions cannot be met in any form or fashion, then you can, say, you can be rest assured that you will not thrive. And that is the point at which you say, I must do something else. And I know it's hard to even think of saying that when, you know, you've got family, you've got kids, you've got this, you've got that. Um, but we have to, you know, really say to ourselves, you know, is this a place I can survive? And if it isn't, I know I can't thrive here. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we're all, at, you know, doing this thing of deconstructing 
-hmm. a paradigm of universalism and objectivity and rationality. Um, but we're at the same time um, constructing a paradigm. And I think you all definitely, in the various ways that you are looking at and analyzing what's going on with white respectability, white rage, right, white incredulity, <laughs> um, and the place of anger in our ability to survive and thrive as legitimate. <laughs> Um, all of that, I think, is part of the paradigm we're constructing. And it's a paradigm that I think ultimately uh, is going to make the academy a better place for everybody, not just us. <laughs> uh, because there's a lot of pretending going on uh, on the part of everybody to survive in the current academy that we have. You know, because there are all these notions of what a real scholar looks like. Mm -hmm. And everybody's trying to be that, whatever it is. <laughs> and yes, it usually looks like um, the most senior white male in the particular context you're in. But um, you all are asking the right questions to push against that. And I think the more and more we're willing to say, um, just standing our ground <laughs> is enough to also shift the paradigm, reconstruct the paradigm, as well as perhaps, uh, to speak in sort of theological or religious terms, perhaps create a real metanoia, that radical conversion, you know, that's necessary, that real turning around, the whole reorientation that is necessary for us to actually start seeing each other and engaging interrelationally to knowing that life is always intersectional, <laughs> that life uh, is always about the contextual interactive of all these social dynamics of uh, racism, sexism, classism, ableism. I mean, we got a lot of isms always going on in the context. So, um, my last point will be, and this is where I'm working currently in my own thinking is about, you know, how do we have a moral community? Because moral communities set up boundaries of either exclusion or inclusion. They are about who's expendable and who's not. So how do we have a true moral community? That's the question that I'm pushing for rather than just how can we be a better academy? I'll stop for now. Tina, it's yours. <laughs> thank you, Marcia. Uh, thank you all. This was... Um, really good for me to get out of my uh, piles of how to be an anti-racist books, you know, and, and uh, put myself in a position to be called out. And uh, as Paulo Freire says, if you don't risk, you don't create anything. So <clears throat> first thing I want to do is challenge the term junior scholar, <laughs> because I don't know what's junior about you three. <laughs> senior was beyond senior wisdom and I'm I'm grateful for this and I anyway um, and um, also what's the deal with there are uh, so many of us that are New Testament scholars I mean that's not a place that is welcoming and affirming <laughs> um, and you know you think about the textbooks uh, that are majority white supremacist textbooks and we've all been to the Society of Biblical Literature meetings <laughs> with um, all the white male clones and, uh, and you know, this, the patriarchal nature of the field. Um, and we are all doing New Testament scholarship, not the way that we're supposed to. Um, so I think uh, what's happening, and, and this really, you know, is good for my heart to see, you know, the next generation coming and a place like uh, Austin Presbyterian Seminary, 
where um, Margaret uh, Amer OJ teaches, uh, she recently commented on Facebook that there was a new hire. And now I think everybody in Bible is a person of color. And I mean, you know, so the, it's flipped. Um, and as Liz Thea Harris uh, of the Poor People's Campaign and the Cairo Center at Union Theological Seminary says, two steps forward, not one step back, right? So um, I think about my field of New Testament where it's um, very slow to change, but it's changing and they're gonna, just gonna have to catch up. So I think our systems are working against us and our academic systems, our institutional systems. Um, so we must work against the system. And how do we do that? Uh, you know, we're in different social locations in terms of age and position and race and gender, sexuality, all of those intersectional things. Um, and at some point I'd like us, I'm gonna bracket that, I'd like to talk about intersectionality and how it has been um, uh, usurped and um, diluted and all of that. Okay, oh, well, I've been reading Jennifer Nash. I really, uh, anyway, it's a great book. Um, I also want to talk about teaching what you're not, which is what I do. Uh, um, Angela talked about rage, and I came to Agnes Scott College, a historic white women's college, uh, historically, <clears throat> and my chair is the Austin chair, and the Austin family comes from the state I grew up in, uh, North Carolina, the central part of the state. Uh, and uh, Alston was uh, one of the no most notorious slave owners uh, in, the, in the history of North Carolina. And his great grandson did a point of view documentary for PBS um, on you know, the two family reunions he discovered, the white one and the black one. And so my uh, dear colleague who held the Austin chair before I did, uh, John Carey, who was head of the Presbyterian Task Force on Human Sexuality, uh, really put himself uh, out there uh, on that issue. Um, you know, he and I would talk about what, it, what is it to hold the Austin chair when it's, you know, named after this legacy of slavery, um, which we still hold on our campus. And, and this is my broken record of you know paying um really respecting black lot black and brown lives that matter by paying livable wages and having a, dem a truly democratic workplace um and showing institutional respect for all our colleagues um so uh more on that later marcy and i worked this was 2005 when we did that joint statement between columbia theological seminary and agnes scott college uh, on a living wage. We're still working on it. <laughs> so um, I was fortunate enough at age 21 to go to Candler School of Theology at Emory University for my Master of Divinity degree. And the very first, one of the very first classes I was in was a class on Cone, Bart, and Tillich. Now James Cone did his dissertation on Bart's Karl Barth's Theological Anthropology, and he held the office, Paul Tillich's office at Union Theological Seminary, so that, you know, connections there. Um, I was assigned by the professor to present on Cone's, a uh, chapter in Cone's God of the Oppressed. And <clears throat> one of my colleagues in the class, who is now a very dear friend of mine, called me out. We spent an hour and a half, the two of us in conversation, the rest of the class in utter fear <laughs> and disbelief. Um, this person was calling me out that no white woman can talk, can say anything about Cone. And I said, sort of like improv, yes, and. <laughs> so we went back and forth and we've been going back and forth for 40 years. And that person is the Reverend Dr. Randall Bailey which for many of you will come as no surprise. And he and I have been doing class exchanges um, 
well, now he comes to me because he's retired from uh, Interdenominational Theological Center, of course. But, um, oh, and over the years, there's been a shift. And I'm going to use this as my kind of example. Um, when I first got to Agnes Scott in the fall of 1989, <laughs> which seems unbelievable, um, I had all white classes and white students who were angry, talk about white incredulity, and just could not believe that Renita Weems was such an angry black woman, you know, just a sister away, right? <laughs> so, um, so from there to today, 30 years later, and um, that whole uh, diversity of the class is flipped. I have DACA recipients, uh, refugees, especially from Burma. I have uh, African-American, Ghanaian, uh, international students from China and Korea. It's, it's flipped and it's, it's so much better. And over the years with uh, Professor Bailey coming to my class, uh, if you know him, he's one to try to agitate and in a good way. And um, the last time he came, last two times he's come, he, he went away kind of sad because the students were getting it and on his side and not um, scandalized by, by what he said. Um, so the, it's, you know, that I want to get back to the teaching what you're not because with um, all the current events, I'm seeing something that I'm also doing. <laughs> so I'm calling myself out which is this kind of woke Olympics um, of who can uh, have the most woke syllabus and curriculum, <laughs> especially if you're white, you know, even if it's really actually tokenized or other, other things, um, you know, not well, not, I guess, underdeveloped. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I'm calling myself out on it too because it's it's coming up in the fall. Um, and so I, I don't know if the rest of y'all are seeing that and um, and I just think it's an interesting phenomenon um, of white liberalism and, and sort of neoliberal, uh, well, neoliberalism is, is generally colorblind. But this is sort of a, a white liberal, neoliberal. I'm, I'm not colorblind, but, um, and I'm going to prove it because I'm going to have uh, a reading from Martin Luther King Jr., right? Um, so, uh, you know, in the whole racial capitalist system where, um, you know, whiteness is a commodity and that's been, uh, that's been brought up too, and how that um, underdevelopment of white people, and I, I grew up in a very poor, poor rural part of Eastern North Carolina, uh, where the Reverend William Barber also works, um, it, you know, and its ties and its development into white nationalism. Um, so uh, I think, um, and get back to curriculum and then I'll, I'll stop, I'll close. Uh, Wayne Yang and Eve Tuck have talked about decolonizing uh, your syllabus and decolonizing the curriculum. Actually, uh, Wayne Yang has, has been pushing that. And he says, we shouldn't talk about um, decolonizing the university, but universities that decolonize. Um, and, and that, I think, filters into every aspect of the, of the institution, um, from those who mow our lawns, at uh, the same people Mo at Columbia Theological Seminary as Mo at Agnes Scott College, and the same people police. Um, so uh, if we're if we're working against the system, um, it means uh, taking those uh, steps together, and y'all have modeled that, uh, Carrie, Sharon, and Angela so well. Um, so I want to talk, I, I would like to hear more from you about um, intersectionality and, uh, oh, one other thing, um, we're really big at, and, and many colleges are this way, at, um, you know, we've worked on this because we have a Center for Diverse, Diversity and Inclusion, 
and we have named a vice president and a dean or something, you know, lots of titles thrown on. And, and I think the people in those jobs have very tough jobs and are very talented at their jobs. And so I'm not want to talk about the person, I want to talk about the system. I think it's a way to police um, and to hold down any kind of radical element, especially our very, very wise students who see through it. Um, uh, so I will stop there and hope for more dialogue here. And I, I appreciate everybody uh, who's joined us tonight. So thank you. All right, so uh, I, I, I'd like to put a couple of questions out there and then we have some questions. We'll have some questions that have been going through our chats, right, right uh, Rebecca? Uh, so um, um, let me um, put this in context. What are, what are, what are institutions allow? I, you all just opened up a whole can of worms here. But uh, so, um, I can I can remember going. That was exactly our intention. Just wanted yes, to. yes, yes. <laughs> you did it well. So um, I can remember a couple of years ago being invited to apply for a position, right? And so I went to this school, and uh, the African American person who was the head of this committee, not in Bible. Uh, but uh, met me at the airport and, you know, took me for uh, coffee and almost immediately said to me, my people in Bible, I do not understand um, uh, the, the uh, privileging of context. And I'm like, oh my God, I wish I could just turn back around. <laughs> I just, every, took everything in me to stay. And so that night before, before the interview started, I kid you not, this is the things white men can be just slapped on the wrist for and so forth. That as we sat at the table, the one white male at the table intentionally sat with his back to me. Nobody. <laughs> You know, and, 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 and you have to perform through all this. You know, I'm this, in my mind, this whole thing is going through, do I stay? Do I get up? <laughs> what do I do? Uh, but I stayed. But this is a question you all brought up about privilege, thriving, and surviving, right? And so that, that very white male said to me at one point, says, well, you look like you have uh, survived all this publishing you have done. Um, and I said to him, there's a difference between surviving and thriving. He did not respond. So I'd like you to talk about the difference between surviving and thriving. You can be dying and publishing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Marcia. Thank you, Dr. Tina. I think you all are bringing up so many different points that we are wrestling with. Thinking about thriving and surviving, I think for me, I'm, I was not the first career, second career student. I think I look at Bible scholarship as my fourth career. So I came out of being an older adult, going back to school, and then getting a PhD in Bible. And remember thinking easily that these people will try to kill you. Mm -hmm. And I always made it a point to say to myself, I don't want this academy enough to kill me. It, mm -hmm. It's not worth it. And so I think for me, I've had a lot of conversations with myself to say, what can I do that I will still thrive with friends, with scholarship that makes a difference, not just doing the scholarship that no one will read or that no one will, will even 
that will read and think that a white man wrote it because I think that's the one piece that was always interesting in both my master's program and in part of my PhD program that they wanted us or they were trying to train us to white, uh, write white, to, <laughs> they were training us to white, <laughs> but they were training us to write objectively so that you wouldn't know that I was an embodied black woman. And I never wanted that. And I think that's part of the thriving for me, for me to be my authentic voice, my authentic self. Now, one thing that I'm really wrestling with though, is this language of diversity and inclusion. So let me, so before you go off my question, yes. uh, this, is, this is a problem um, for me, because I've, I've basically probably been teaching about 14, 15 years, probably into my third year, I figured out to start doing the work my soul must have, right? Mm -hmm. But you can be doing the work your soul must have in a hostile environment not only attacks your spirit, but your, your spiritual body, all of you, right? You can still be doing that work and not thriving, right? Uh, so, you know, institutions can use that, oh, she's doing well, or oh, she's publishing, or oh, she's riddling her due, and, think, and then have used that as an excuse for the institution yeah. Including the hostile senior white men to stay as it is. Yeah. When yeah. you say that, are you, because one thing I'm thinking about right now is the recent Inside Higher Ed um, article that talked about the two African American men who went up for tenure and then did not get tenure because they said that their scholarship was either less than or, or not good enough. And it seemed like those men were doing the work that they wanted to do and that made their souls thrive. But then when it came time for the institution to reward them with tenure, they said, no, it's not good enough. Is that specifically what you're asking? Because I think for me, I don't want, I, I kind of want to have that Marcia Riggs attitude that if it begins to, to take me out or if I need to go and Lord ask it, ask God, do I need to stay here or do I need to go? I think to always be willing to have that conversation with God, with myself, with my family, with my husband and whatever, whatever it may be, may be. And not have to, yeah, so yeah not have to like depend, mm -hmm. depend yeah. so Should much. So let me press that a little bit because uh, there are different uh, uh, circumstances. One, yeah, if, yeah. If, if the thing you trained for is this, and mm -hmm. the thing you may have to go back to is perhaps being a secretary, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't have a, a, a husband or a husband who would understand that, a partner. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of scenarios where, yeah. yes, you can say, well, I'm not going to stay here, right? And, and in fact, perhaps, uh, there are people, particularly black women, who leave or are pushed out, right? Yeah, yeah. And and they are doing at the time the the work their souls must have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they chose to leave, but they don't want to. But now they're not doing the work they can do, and they they right. hope that they would be able to get back into the yeah, academy, and they yeah. have not been able. They are not jobs for everybody. Yes. Right. right. The uh, system yeah. must change. It, it must not be that yeah. we are always in a place to say that I will leave. Yeah. And leave all those years behind that I put into becoming yeah. that I've become and the money. Yeah. Can I, I, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I jump in on the conversation? I, yes. Yes, yes Sarah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, uh, Angela, but you know, one of the things I was thinking of is because uh, this is something I kind of sort of went through, um, you know, that I was part of an institution that was deeply toxic. I was doing the work um, that was not just fulfilling my soul. It was also fulfilling the tenure record. Mm -hmm. But what I started realizing is right in the middle, because there was something that, about my embodiment that was not fitting in. I was not fitting. I was a, a square peg in the round, in the round hole, as they say in mm -hmm. the American context. But um, 
what I realized started happening was even though I was doing the work, I was doing the publication, I wasn't writing for my soul, um, the rules started to change on me, right? And that is something that in white institutions do, they, they, they change. And you're right, you know, um, I did leave the place. I did feel at one point I couldn't because um, of my immigration status, I had to stay. Um, and I am at a different institution now. And I feel like, um, you know, it took a lot out of me to go in every single day into that institution that was so toxic. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways I think mm -hmm. I, you know, sometimes, and this is hard because I was just joking to Angela and Carrie. I was telling them, I said, I'm, I'm going to leave the institution. I'm going to leave academy, the academia and, you know, maybe I'll just become a person who goes around and sells soap. I, I don't know. I mean, many of us say yeah. that. I think, yeah. I, said that. I think I said that for the last six years. Yes, yes. Yeah. But I yeah. think what gives me hope is the classroom. And, mm. you know, sometimes I, sometimes, you know, I have to stay so that my students of color are able to witness my embodiment so I can be there for them and or even my white students and just show them that there is a different face to academia. And, and I'm not saying I need to stay in, you know, at the detriment to my own physical being, but it's very easy. I think, uh, you know, Dr. Rick said it, we can just keep moving from institution to institution, but because it's so, em it's the same. so entrenched, mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah. In every institution, you're still going to find the same, you know, mm -hmm. stuff. So, you know, the place where I find hope is, is in the classroom, is where I'm, you know, infecting. And I don't like to say I'm opening. I'm infecting the minds of my students with um, thinking differently, writing differently, expressing themselves differently encouraging them to get into the academia, um, you know, th that kind of stuff. So I think to me, the surviving and thriving is two part. One is you can survive with conversation partners outside, yeah. but you know, most of our work happens in the classroom and how are we going into the classroom and changing minds there? So that's how I, that's how I would answer your question with the surviving. And and that's a that's a very difficult yeah. task. That's not an yeah. all up, that's not an all downhill task. Yeah, right. right. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> and the, class, the classroom, let's be honest, can be a thankless place. You know, yes. as, uh, when we had the men on, it's, uh, uh, Brandon Maxwell was apologizing to Dr. Um, Stephanie Crawford for not appreciating her when he had her in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So even yeah. though that we even talk about that in very romanticized ways, yes, we have an yeah. impact, right? But mm -hmm. every day it's like it can be a, a struggle. And yeah. we thank God, you know, I'm going to put together a book of, of yeah. the, the notes so that I can look at the positive <laughs> notes, right? Uh, so, yeah, so let's move on. Let's we have you questions. We have about 11 questions, Dr. Uh, Smith. Do you have something to say? Dr. Smith, oh, you have about 11 questions. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, I'll say something really quick. And this, this whole conversation actually really brings up Dr. Dolores Williams in my mind, this question of survival, question of quality of life, and that in this process, being able to have people that you can dialogue on, that the idea of survival, the idea of thriving is going to be different. What those limits that yeah. Dr. Riggs talked about, um, what your final I'm walking out the door is, is going to be at a different place and how you actually also engender spaces that you can have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it might not always be with your partner or spouse um, around mm -hmm. your finances, but you know, what, what does that soul work? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, to, and on that note, there was a doctoral student out of, um, uh, when, when I was giving a lecture uh, to some scholars in India a couple of weeks ago, and she said she needs people. And so I said, we're, we're trying to do something. There are, pe are people out there need people. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. doesn't have the people you all have. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, yeah. I'm thankful for Dr. Marcia. <laughs> for, for the first time, I'm in a place where I do have people mm -hmm. close by, right? Wow. Okay. So, yeah. uh, so you want to go to the diversity issue. Do we want to go? Uh, oh, yeah. Other questions, yes. Well, because I think diversity and diversity and inclusion, as Dr. Tina has pointed out, has kind of become the thoughts and prayers in the gun movement. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We kind of use that language of do we have a diversity and inclusion officer? And it's really just, as you said, another way to hold down the radical element of within our students or even sometimes within our faculty. Mm -hmm. The problem with diversity and inclusion is it's not really being anti-racist and there's a difference between mm -hmm. diversity and inclusion and actually being actively anti-racist. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that connects to oh. what Dr. Pippin was saying about um, our syllabus and the woke Olympics, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you can put these people in your syllabus and feel good, but if you haven't actually radically shifted pedagogies, mm -hmm. um, how you're evaluating students, um, what opportunities that you're giving them, looking at the whole of it, um, mm -hmm. then it is, it's just tokenism. It's just, right. yeah. you know, and usually, bless those who even think about having more than a day or a section, right? Mm -hmm. That is contextualized or other, like we'll do real scholarship and then we'll do this. And so it's yeah. pushing a little, but the actual ingrained ways that we focus in our classrooms um, and engage our students hasn't. Yeah. And, and yeah. one example. Yes, how we respond to them. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, one example comes from uh, the theory and methods teaching and undergraduate religious studies programs. The mm -hmm. dominant textbooks are dead white men up to Freud. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then in the second and subsequent editions, you add a chapter. Right. You chapter with African Americans, but they're all men. And then you add a feminist chapter, but they're all white women. And then you add a decolonizing chapter. And then in one book, uh, a chapter that has critical theory that's Foucault for some reason. Uh, you know, not I don't have anything. <laughs> really, I use Foucault still, however. And so there's, um, you know, the, the white supremacist textbook system is firmly in place and to yeah. try to dislodge that is, uh, is seen as, you know, messing with the discipline because right. you've got to yeah. know this traditional uh, theory. And I know in the teaching of ethics, um, I've had difficulty with, well, how do you teach Iris, Iris Young's critique of John Rawls mm -hmm. unless you also do you know, the background of John Rawls and, you know, you got yeah. all these white people before you can ever get to the white feminists. Yeah. So yeah. we have to make these choices and um, the choices are, are not difficult for me as, as anymore <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, but then I know I have to be reminded and my students will remind me and I know that pedagogically I'm in a good place when my students are challenge me when I'm the holder of the power there's a huge power imbalance um, I write the letters of recommendation I you know etc grades you know the whole system is warped um, and so when they come to me and say you know this isn't working or this isn't inclusive you think it is but it's not then I know oh yeah okay now we're, we're getting somewhere and I have the privilege as a full cisgender professor, white professor to close my door to the whole thing, to mm -hmm. use those textbooks, I mean, you know, and not listen to anything. And that's yeah. what's scary. That's yeah. and, You know, to jump in, uh, Dr. Pippin, you know, what you were saying, yeah, you know, and it, it's very rare though, you know, very rare that, you know, a professor recognizes their privilege. And you know, you know, one of the reasons why we talked about ourselves as the junior scholar is the is the way institutions curb us That's from right. doing that kind of work in the classroom. Yeah. Um, and you know, and again, and it's something very interesting that's been uh, coming around with institutions right now is you have more people of color now graduating with PhDs, mm -hmm. and ironically, institutions have suddenly decided that tenure is worthless. You know, and they're taking off tenure and now hiring people on contract. I mean, you know, how do you begin to fight in the system? And, you know, sometimes like we talk about wearing the white mask, you know, we have to wear the white mask yeah. and, um, you know, pay our dues. But if we're not taking that mask off regularly, hmm. uh, it's just going to remain and just start infusing in us and, you know, yeah. ultimately kill us. Right. 
Yeah, when I hear I mask, that. I think of KKK, right? Because that's yeah. the culture I grew up in. Yes. Um, you know, and so, yeah, we got to, you know, rip the mask off. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we have a couple uh, questions. Okay, I'll wait. I'll let the questions go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so so this is going to be a question and answer, right? So, yep. but we'll come back to you. Uh, so, Dr. Kalu, Kaylin, 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 yes. wants to know yes. um, what happens when we are not allowed to be our full selves? Hmm. Who wants to take that? I'm reminded of what we were talking about with reflecting one another. And see, I think it becomes hard because we know that oftentimes we're walking around our institutions not being our full selves. That's just, that's the truth of the matter most of the times. And so our conversation has been around how can we be our full selves with each other when oftentimes we recognize we can't be our full selves in our institutions. That, that's so, so can you go into um, uh, the ways in which you feel you cannot be? It does, is it tied to your... Um, um to your status as a junior scholar is part of it that yeah right? yeah i would think so because oftentimes you don't feel like especially if you're new or if you're in a faculty meeting or wherever you may be you're feeling as though you have to listen and listen and listen and listen and not say too much because you don't you don't know the lay of the land or mm -hmm. you know how your folks may react if you push back on an idea mm -hmm oftentimes you're listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you do speak up, uh, as one of my junior colleagues who's uh, a South Asian um, Shia Muslim feminist scholar was told by a white male colleague in her department um, that anonymously a friend had called him very, he was very concerned because she was speaking up too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, you know, I tried to point out how wrong that was in so many ways. And, and the, you know, the white colleague, male colleague would not stop talking and not hear it. Um, so I think if you do speak up, then, well, you're speaking too much, right? And that's what yeah. it's for. Yeah. Are you too loud or you're too angry or, you know, they, they put something on that so that they protect themselves from the real truth. Yeah. And yeah. And to, to answer uh, Jennifer Kalen's question, also, I think, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the detriment also of not being, to, not being able to show up fully or, you know, to be in your full self is this fracturedness that begins to happen yeah. with, the, with our subjectivity, that we're, you know, constantly moving back and forth wearing the mask, taking it off, you know, wearing the mask, taking it, and, you know, at some point it just becomes so exhausting because yeah. you're moving in and out of these uh, white systems of power. And um, it really starts to take a toll on your body and, you know, your mental health and your physical health, your emotional and spiritual health. So um, at least, you know, finding certain spaces where you can be your authentic self, um, <laughs> And then navigating your way in the institution. And this is what, you know, uh, Angela and, and Carrie and me talk about all the time. And making sure you uh, get to this, you, you climb up the ladder and then make the conscious effort to change, you know, for your other junior colleagues of color who, who come behind you. Who come behind you. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's where I think the mirror is important because very often people of color will climb up the ladder of success and then forget, you know, because they have now become so close to whiteness that they forget to see how the system is still in place. Yeah. So this yes. is where I think the mirror becomes very important. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's hard. And I, I'd have to say, because I entered the academy, you know, second career and older, um, I entered, uh, some people may, maybe a few may remember me as a little quiet, uh, but others will remember me as outspoken. 
and I'm sure that I, because of that, I think when I think we're counted, um, that I did burn some bridges, quite a few bridges, I'd say, right? Because I I was older and I was and I'm I was and am of the mindset that if you start allowing yourself to be silenced when it counts, that it becomes wow. a habit and even more mm -hmm. difficult to speak up when you need to. Mm -hmm. So I think those of us, I think administrators, you know, my first job at Ashland, I remember the president saying to me, we want to hear from everybody and I took him at his word, right? Yes, there was, there was somebody who said to uh, uh, a mentor of mine, said, said um, uh, Bitsy so 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 so, and I, I went to my senior colleague and I said, so so said, you said so so. <laughs> full-time person in Detroit, I had to speak for those students. Yes. Yeah. And that yeah. meant that yeah. often I was at odds with the rest of my department. Yes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. there were ye years that I was thankful I was situated in Detroit, not in Ashland. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have to be supportive. I, I think given my history, it's a miracle. <laughs> out for me. Uh, so um, I think yeah. we have to, um, uh, I mean, this goes back to the tension uh, as we were talking about earlier, being yourself. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. you're, uh, regardless of what happens, thinking you have a way out. But, yeah. um, but this is part of that. When we say we're going to be quiet because out of fear, of uh, reprisal, right? When our voices yeah. may be necessary and needed, and maybe mm -hmm. there's other voices. I mean, uh, when, a, when a very important uh, vote came up that would have adversely impacted students in Detroit, I had to, you know, side against, and they, and they should have known that I was siding against my department because they mm -hmm. tried, because they silenced me in the department meeting. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but the but the full faculty wanted to go the more just way, and that's the way we ended up going, right? Good. Yeah. And and they apologized for silencing me after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um um so I I think um it is a risk, mm -hmm. but um I think those of us who are um, senior um. And administrators are at white allies who are mostly administrators, right? Yeah. We need to have the backs. Uh, yeah. You want to hear their voices? You truly do, and you value all voices. And then uh, the institution needs to have the backs of the junior scholars mm. and your yeah. colleagues too. Mm -hmm. And and that's exactly I think what being full, like if we're thinking of fullness of self too for white folk, that means if you're claiming to be anti-racist, that's not just something that you're gonna put on and off. Yes. Like that fullness is, as you're saying, being there for your students, being there, speaking up, using the power and privilege that you have. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. So our question, the next question from Michelle Armster is how do we create, develop collaborative relationships and dialogues uh, and actions? Hmm. I think to the trust. <laughs> yeah, yes. I, I, there has to be that that space yes. of trust. This yes. isn't just something of, oh my gosh, something has happened in our world. I need to go make sure I have a black friend. And then yes. I need to make sure we do something together. And you know, I need to let an institution or a journal or you know, any kind of system of power decide who should be in a conversation and who shouldn't. It takes this kind of long developed space. I mean, you know, the way the three of us have come together, Angela and I, I'll just say, you know, a little bit about our background. We didn't like each other at first. We were indifferent towards one another. But then when we were dealing with systemic racism, when we were jointly in a doctoral program, um, 
and basically both had to walk away from that doctoral program as a part of it, we had each other's backs. And yeah. that kind of trust building is what creates the space to actually do this coalition work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have anybody else on that before we uh, yeah that? just you know what one thing and uh w during during this conversation that we were having and you know angela and me kept saying we got to take off the white mask and um carrie said you know we white people have to take off that mask too white people have to step out of their whiteness they have to recognize that whiteness is toxic and they have to step out of it um and that takes practice and to me that was so powerful um and I also think that's why this relationship works is to have someone who is willing to see that, you know, and who's willing to, to risk that and, um, you know, is, uh, is working on it, just like I have to work on my flaws and we all have to work on our flaws. So, yeah. you know, that was very helpful also. Yeah. And it takes trust, yeah. yeah. So I want to push this because it is hard to find this kind of... Um, um, collegiality and friendship that you have, and we know be that a big, a big um, uh, uh, reason for that is racism, right? Yeah. So, so pushing on her question, I'm going to address perhaps an elephant in the room, right? Uh, so, uh, Dr. Jacobs mentioned, um, you know, how how people like to touch our hair, right? When it's different. <laughs> Well, when I was in India, two people. <laughs> yes. yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We were in a group, and while I was not looking, some uh, 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 one of my Indian colleagues was touching my hair. Yes. And then later, one of them asked me, asked me a different one, could she touch my hair? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So there is the, there is, there is, there, there's not only racism that prevents these, these collaborations between white women, but also between black women and other women of color. Color, and yes. we need uh, to deal yeah. with that elephant in the room too. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. That's why I think, um, you know, the way actually Angela and me became friends was in Wabash, I was telling her my story when I grew up in India, I was, my nickname in school was um, um, Bushman. That's what they called me. Mm. They called me Bushman. Mm. And uh, because I have dark skin and they said I, I was very nappy hair, mm. right? That's, that, that's what they said. You can imagine they, my response. <laughs> and yeah, and so Angela was like, what? And I said, yeah, you know, I mean, it is so common. And that's why I brought up Priyanka Chopra who, um, you know, tweeted about George Floyd's murder, but will not talk about the lynchings and the Dalit uh, killings that take place in India. It, we as Indian people are very complicit and um, what is it, what you, profit from the capitalization of whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Priyanka Chopra refused to use the word woman of color because, and the reason why Indian women don't like to use women of color, and I'm kind of generalizing, but you know, mm -hmm. not all Indian women are the same, but people who come from India don't like to use the word woman of color because they feel like that means you're black, right? And this is how whiteness gets into, because this is so ingrained, it, it, it uh, hinders us from forming those systems as, um, from bonds of allyship. Um, you know, and it is, you know, like just turn on a Bollywood movie. Every single actor is light skin. Uh, the, the, the bleaching industry is a big, is a yeah. big industry in India. I myself have done that um, till I realized how harmful and, you know, terrible it is not just for your body, but also for your psyche. Um, yeah. But, you know, like learning to form those bonds. I think is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you come to this country and you think, you know, everyone, all the white people who are touching your hair and telling you, you look so pretty, they're all your friends, till they actually then show themselves to you. And that's when you go, oh, you just think of me as your pet, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I've had that experience happen to me and I literally had to do the 360 round. But yes, that's this is why I think these conversations have to have to break intersectionally. 
Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, and I think for me, it's always been about the intentionality behind a lot of our conversations because I I know that we've all um, we've all kind of put each other our bodies on the line for one another. Yes, and that's the one thing that's been interesting about our our relationship is that I know that Carrie has put her body on the line for me and I've done the same for her and Sharon's done for me and then Sharon's done for Karen for Carrie. And I think once you see that there are folks who can do that, then you can have hard, difficult conversations that say, well, you know, Angela, you acted very heteronormative to Carrie. And I have to say, oh, dad, that was wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry. And when I have that conversation where you're willing to be called out or you're you're willing to call out your friend because that's your friend and you have to but i i don't think i could do that with everybody well in fact i know i couldn't do that with everybody so you have to continue to have those conversations and try to recognize the the intentionality hopefully behind the conversations that you have and kind of go from there because you can't do that with everybody yeah and i think this relationship is powerful right and that's what that's what whiteness thrives on is dividing people of color, um, you know, and, but when you see past it and you can forge those bonds, that's when, you know, unraveling it becomes, um, you know, easier and, and important and also not impossible. Right. Yeah. I've, I've seen another syndrome and, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm imagining this <laughs> over the years, uh, that um, a lot of uh, white folks will go to anti-racism uh, workshops, mm-hmm. and especially the kind that don't do systemic work, that just, you know, it's all about your in- individual prejudices and not systemic racism, anyway, mm-hmm. um, but both. and Or, um, uh, you know, LGBTQ awareness workshops, whatever, and then you get to put a safe zone tag on your door and and that you've somehow got some kind of certificate and you've arrived yeah. and you've done the work. See, yeah. I've done the work. I have the certificate yeah. <laughs> and, and it, that it's not um, like a lifetime thing yes. that there's, there's, I mean, pedagogically for me, it's like I'm facing the, the fall and I, I, it's like, oh my God, I have to, you know, redo and rethink. And, you know, even if I did it before and Ferguson was happening and I use Kelly Brown Douglas and well, now it's like a hundred Ferguson's and since, yeah. and, yeah. you know, yeah. how, how am I going to respond to that in a way that's authentic and, mm-hmm. and anyway, so it's a lifetime thing for, for white people. Yeah. Yes, I know I come back to Dr. Yeah. Riggs had a question. But you, you know, we like to talk about being shaped in iniquity, where, where mm-hmm. racism is a sin, and this is something we have all been shaped by in some way or another, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's a it's a continually unpacking and facing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Riggs, you had a question, then we're gonna go back go to Allison Gray's question. Oh, I didn't actually have a question. I was oh, gonna make oh. a comment way back. And I was trying to let the questions guide the conversation rather than make my comment. And I can still wait. (laughs) Go ahead. What? You want me to wait or you want me to make my comment? You can make your comment. Okay, my comment is, uh, and I know I will not be received necessarily well even by my my co-panelists. And since I'm the interloper anyway, Yeah. For someone else, I wasn't originally to be on this. You were meant. You were meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things for me, though, is you know, I guess as an ethicist, I'm always thinking about how is it that we function as moral agents, mm-hmm. and moral agents have to have particular frames, mm-hmm. and I I'm still frustrated by conversations where we're still you know, fighting against an academy as it has been defined already mm-hmm. for us. Mm-hmm. Rather than the frame out of which I'm participating is one that is counter to that frame already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that, yeah, it can get me into all kinds of trouble, but I'd rather be in trouble because 
I'm believing that the agent, my agency will actually shift the frame. Not that I want to be included in the one that exists. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I mm -hmm. want something radically different to emerge. Mm -hmm. And I, in many ways, you know, I, I'm still hearing this, well, how do we, you know, um, fight against the ways in which we get excluded? Well, yes and no. <laughs> Why is it the question, how do I just live as a person, uh, a fully liberated and liberating person mm -hmm. <laughs> within this academy who already believes I have a place, <laughs> I have a call to open this space to other people I like know. me, mm -hmm. both right. as a teacher and as a peer to other colleagues who look like me, mm -hmm. and so be it, <laughs> you know. I know people don't believe that's how I've done my career, but it is how I've done my career. And I don't have a partner, I'm not married, Mitzi. I was making these decisions as a person who might have to go start her catering business because <laughs> Got thrown out of the yeah. No, no, no. I had I, I like to I had too. That's why I said I burned a lot of bridges. But I was well, I there. Angela right. saying, "Well, my husband, this." I'm like, I, I had, <laughs> well, I had one. So the thing is, though, why, why though? You, then, you no, it was just another burden. But anyway, <laughs> the frame of what the academy is no. and what is problematic about it as the way we're going to talk about how we transform it. I like to think it. I was that person too. I mean, that's why it has not been an easy road. Okay. I, yeah. say that I would have the conversation with my husband, but my husband does not take care of me or, you know, even with- You look like a body mother. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, let's don't get off on that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's stick with how we're for how we're framing our frameworks within the academy. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, no. no, I want to know exactly how you're framing your agency. Yeah, can I can I jump in? I think I think you know I this <laughs> honestly this is my first time, uh, Dr. Riggs, where I've heard you know we've met for the first time and I've heard your story. I didn't even know that there that this was another path right because the path when you get through your phd is very is very cookie cutter right mm -hmm. you you get the you get the you know you uh, finish your dissertation you get it published you get a tenure track job and i felt like i had to go off the path because you know i did have a tenure track job um you know i i was checking all the boxes but my tenure track job was not a place that was a place where i could um thrive so I, I left the tenure track job and I went to an institution that doesn't do ten tenure anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. and I am learning, I am swimming. I, I didn't even know there was another way. And to me, I think your question of how do you change the framework, I think is, is very, very important because it's giving me an idea of, I don't have to put up with the bullshit. Right. Um, I can figure out another way of being in the academia. Um, I don't write, I don't need to write like a white man. My, my dissertation isn't uh, written like that. Um, you know, and, and just, you know, speak my truth and stay in my truth. Um, so to me, to me that, you know, so thank you for actually saying there's another way guys. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I think I tried to articulate that. Uh, perhaps uh, not as, as well as you did, Dr. Riggs. <laughs> but yeah. in terms of, uh, of, of, and, and because, not necessarily because, it's not easy. It's not easy to go up against the system. It is not easy to speak your mind. There's always consequences. Yes. And I believe I have paid those consequences. Not that I, not that it was easy to do. Mm -hmm. But I could I couldn't do anything less. Yeah. 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 I think that's that's yeah. part yeah, of the I conversation. The same thing yes. too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because with Carrie and I, we both had to do that in the PhD programs that we basically were kicked out of. Mm -hmm. Because we were like, no, we're not gonna just say, Oh, 
okay, yeah, you can keep doing your, your business as usual and profiting off black and brown bodies. And we were like, no. And when the, um, you know, our advisor was like, well, you have to do this or you have to do that. And I'm thinking, I'm a grown woman. I don't have to do that. Yeah. I else, which is what you kind of have. I, I think that's how we started our, our PhD work with that framing of, I, I'm not somebody's child, so I'm going to have to be my moral agent and make some decisions and, and say some things to folks that may get me kicked off a path or it may not get me kicked yeah. off a path. Yeah. But I just and, have and to just go ahead and do to, that. To talk about how we came to this conversation, right? And yeah. um, when we started talking, we, we started talking and we said, okay, um, we really have this important conversation. Are there people who want to hear it? Mm. And we actually get, got to a point where we said, okay, if nobody wants to hear it, we'll <laughs> record the damn thing and put it up on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, how do I create my own opportunity? That's right. I think that is, yeah, because, yeah. you know, I am tired of waiting for the academia to open its doors. It just right. doesn't open mm. it up for me. Yeah. So sometimes yeah. I just have to go and do my own thing. I, you know... I like recently wrote a blog on design thinking and biblical interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that because I kept thinking, is someone going to give me that option? No one's going, okay, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. 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 You know. Yeah. You need a book, yeah. write it. Yeah. You need a book, write it. <laughs> <laughs> you need a book for your classroom, write it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and because that's what we also teach our students. We ask our to, students to live in their truth. Yeah. And you're yeah. right. I mean, wow. Yeah, this is this yeah. is very helpful. That's, that's yeah. why no. that's how the, my int uh, my COVID intro came to be is I refuse to use a white text by white males any longer, right? I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I refuse to make them the centerpiece of my classroom and this is not the way I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so mm -hmm. I so you know, I had to find a way to quickly write that book. <laughs> Thank yeah. God for Dr. Uh, Yang Sak Kim. Uh, we are thankful for that book. Yes, yes. <laughs> and sometimes we, you know, we create our own scholarship. We create our own ways, and yeah, and yeah. and to know too, yeah, I like the that. importance of these relationships. Because um, I remember Tina telling Angela and I the very first time we met her and Cheryl Kirk Dugan, who have been kind of this multi generational mentors. And yeah. you know, Tina said they will try to tear you apart. They will not want you to collaborate. They will not want this to happen. And so to actually be like, if you are forging your own path, if you're finding new ways, who's in it for the long run with you? Mm -hmm. And knowing that, you know, we even had this discussion about, again, this conversation. Well, if we put this in a journal, will our institutions take a co-written piece or does it make you seem like less of an um, a scholar. Uh, the idea of collaboration, of dialogue, of, you know, Sharon's brought up um, different ways of transmitting wisdom and knowledge that isn't just writing like a white man. Mm -hmm. um, how do we hold those spaces? Mm -hmm. um, because, yes, creating and transforming and keeping some of the other pieces at bay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we make the road by walking and we, we do it by walking together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a long haul. I'm quoting Miles Horton of the Highlander Center here. For <laughs> so Allison Gray will have our last question. She says, I hope she's still here. Any thoughts about how to address the ways institutional culture gets weaponized <clears throat> to silence people of color who do speak up? And I think we've been talking about that a little bit, but you may have some more to say. How does it get weaponized to silence people, well, ten years one way, to silence people of color who do speak up? Hey, lower pay. Lower pay, yes. Over over decades, mm -hmm. I've seen with um, with my colleagues of color. Wow. And refusal of your colleagues to partner with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or extra work because you're the you're the advisor for the X group of minoritized students, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you need to be on every committee. <laughs> yes, because they need yeah. diversity, right? Yeah. yeah, and brochures. Yes, <laughs> I've been on many brochures. Yes. <laughs> 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 I 
that be the, um, the, you know, the picture child, the photo child, whatever. Yeah. And some have ways to shame you and other ways try to shame you. Your scholarship, even to ignore you or render you invisible in many ways, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How are they even going to promote your work? Mm -hmm. um, yes. yes. Who's going to get the book release party and who's not? I mean, it's these simple pieces, too, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that are connected to your career. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're fortunate uh, in Decatur, we have a fem radical feminist bookstore, Karis Books. It's, it's, it's the oldest feminist bookstore in the country now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they do book parties. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have to do them for each other. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I think also, you know, it's, it's so helpful to not look at your colleagues as your competition, but as someone that you're rooting for. Yeah. That very rarely happens because we're in like, you know, tear each other apart because that's the academic rigor mode. And, um, you know, yeah. no. Um, and also, you know, tenure, as you, as you, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Smith, that is something that's always held over pe uh, people of color and junior scholars. And I realized from my own experience when I said, I don't care if I don't get tenure, I took that power away mm -hmm. and said, you know, it, it doesn't matter. And it was very liberating for me because I started to realize, okay, I'm going to have to do things a little differently now. Mm. But, you know, sometimes, you know, just, you know, not allowing them to play the psychological game of if you don't fall in line, you know, you won't get the award at the end. Okay, okay. I'll create my own damn award and give it to myself. <laughs> so, so, yeah, and, 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 you know, we, I think, I think we have to acknowledge too, there's never one way to play that, right? Yes, right. Yes. Uh, yeah. so, 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 so when my previous institution uh, attempted to, um, and, well, did deny me first tenure saying, well, actually the first explanation was your Facebook uh, page promotes gay marriage. I'm like, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't have that many posts up there, right? And then it was a blog about, a blog I wrote uh, about my own being uh, um, sexual assaulted as a, as a little girl said so that, that the tone of it, I'm like, well, how do you write that? What kind of tone was I supposed what to kind of tone? Yeah. And it probably was really about money, but the, but the attempt to, and and the question was asked me asked me by by someone who was you know on my side when I began to when I said I was fighting it right why mm -hmm. I said because I deserve it whether I choose to stay here or not I yes. worked for yeah. it right True. I did everything I need to do they may not yeah. like my scholarship but I published it I mm -hmm. published it may not be Eurocentric scholarship but I published. Uh, yeah. Because I did uh, everything and more. Being at a at a at an urban center, there were, there were times I I taught nine and ten courses, right? Yes. So yes. I deserve it, right? Yeah. Um, and so, the, yeah. so you know, you mm. you're different. We choose our battles. We choose, we choose our battles. Yeah. Uh, you know, somebody asked. Uh, what does agency look like, right? And that may look a little different from for each of us, depending on our circumstances, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so any closing comments? We have two minutes left. <laughs> well, I, I'll just say, I think that what Mitzi is doing with these women's dialogues is exactly the kind of thinking and, and reformulating the frame of the academy that we need. Yeah. So thank you, Mitzi. Oh, thank you, Tina. Thank you. <laughs> I would I, agree. I, thank you. Yes. I am blessed. Yeah. Uh, these ladies, you know, this was uh, uh, their idea for their platform here. But I'm, I'm always just amazed at there. Someone said it. Uh, I think it was Dr. Mindy McGarry Short. Uh, she may have said it first. The generosity of the scholars who come on here, right? Because we do, we, we do, some of us, you know, do believe we should get paid every time, but we, you know, we are in uh, difficult circumstances and we've been in difficult circumstances for a while. And, and one of the major um, uh, objectives is to bridge the gap between our scholarship and, uh, and that of the wider community and to, to, to offer this space for critical engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. About the things our souls must have, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I thank you, each, each one of you, I thank you for choosing this platform. 
uh, and wish to have, and I thank you for all that was said tonight in many ways that we will hear that you all blessed uh, everyone who was able to uh, tune in and those who will look at the recording. And you all will, of course, get a link of the recording once it's ready. Yeah. Right? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. I, I also want to, I want to thank because, uh, thank all, all, all the, uh, the panelists because I think, you know, through the course of this conversation, the, the pushing us to envision and reframing mm -hmm. our own agency in the academia, which yes. is so important, mm -hmm. um, you know, was was very helpful also. So I do want to thank you for, for demonstrating that to us. Well, thank yes. you. Um, thank you, scholars, for modeling that for us, Carrie, Sharon, and Angela. Too. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. And Mitzi. <laughs> yes. Thank you. There are people out there who are talking about collaborative. It's, be, it's being asked a junior, um, uh, well, PhD students of, of color, especially women, are asking how can they have a space where they can learn from us? So perhaps think about this, ladies. Every one of you here. <laughs> is, it is it possible we can do that once or twice a month? And yes. ask them. Yes. Yes. That is something that was missing for me when I was in my PhD. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think I would have been a different person mm -hmm. yeah. if I had been privy to these kinds of conversations and dialogue. I just have to siphon some of my colleague Mitzi's energy in order to do <laughs> everything that she imagined. Service energy. You know, I think about my grateful. My mother yeah. was in a wheelchair from the age I was about from from when I was about 10 years of age. But before that, she would say to us. If I was on, she would say to us, if I was on my feet, you wouldn't tell which corner my dress tail went around last. <laughs> Maybe I'm channeling her. I don't know. <laughs> okay. right. Thank you right. so right. much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>